So um, this is the Northampton Board of Health meeting. Uh, we will start with public comment. Um, those of you uh, who are here from the public, uh, you cannot unmute yourselves right now. Um, we're gonna ask you to keep your comments to two minutes, please, please identify yourselves. Um, Suzanne, would you be willing to be a timekeeper? Yes. And if you'd, like to, if you'd like to comment during the set in this session, please raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you first. And if for some reason you're having technical difficulties and you cannot raise your virtual hand, then just raise your hand and we'll try to identify you. And Wave like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, would you like me to call on them, Joanne? Or do yes, you yes, okay. please. All right. So my order might be different, but um, let's see, James. First, let's just start and say that um, this session is being recorded uh, on Zoom. Um, and we'll have um, public comment first, two minutes per person, please. And then we'll open the formal Board of Health. And meeting. please state your first and last name and keep your comments to two minutes. All right, Meredith, go ahead. You want to call on people? So I'm going to call on James. James P. And can you unmute him? I did. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is James Prisbeck, General Manager of the Three County Fair. I'm representing the fair organization and our collective opinion regarding any COVID-related mandates or restrictions. The Three County Fair organization is opposed to any COVID-related mandates or restrictions, including mask mandates indoors or outdoors for the following reasons. Hampshire County is currently only at moderate risk of transmission rates. According to the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, as of August 5th, 2021, 70% of eligible Hampshire County residents, 76% of Franklin County residents, and 65% of Hamden County residents have received at least one dose. And 63, 68, and 58% of those residents, respectively, are fully vaccinated. This information, of course, is currently five days old, and many communities are reporting an increase in individuals seeking vaccination. According to a report by the Center for Infectious Disease and Research Policy, current data suggests that around 70% of the population would need to be immune to achieve here, I'm sorry, would need to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity to COVID-19. We are nearly there. Furthermore, according to breaking news analysis posted by CNN this afternoon, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control Prevention, 99.99% of people who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 have not had a breakthrough case resulting in death or even hospitalization, 99.99% of the entire country. While the Commonwealth is leaving mandates and restriction guidance up to individual communities, officials for the state have allowed businesses to operate at 100% capacity without restrictions of any kind since May 29th, with of course the exception of face coverings required on public transportation systems, hospitals, and other facilities housing vulnerable populations. Since vaccine distribution has become widely available, Massachusetts has been a countrywide leader in getting its population vaccinated. The Three County Fair asked the City of Northampton Board of Health not to institute a mask mandate of any kind of restriction. We understand preventable measures are necessary, but individuals have had the option to get vaccinated or not vaccinated for months. Individuals have had the option to wear a mask or not wear a mask for months. We ask that you do not take the right of individuals away to make their own choices. A mask mandate, even if just indoors, will severely affect business at the Three County Fair, including the New England Paint Horse Show taking place in the Arena Building this weekend. The 2021 Three County Fair planned for September 3rd through the 6th, scheduled to open in just 24 days. The Labor Day weekend fair is needed to operate without any restrictions of any kind in order for it to be financially viable to put on. This fair has been in various stages of planning and executing since the last public fair took place in September 2019. Institution of a mass mandate will put fear into fair group. Fair goers will now question their desire to attend. The fair is filled with indoor performances, including music performances, food and beverage service, variety and entertainment shows, vendors selling arts and crafts, announcers, and agricultural demonstrations. An indoor mass mandate will not allow these individuals to communicate, perform, or sell in the busy, noisy, and active environment that is the fair, essentially taking away more than half of the fair experience. 
even if the fair were to consider moving all of these activities outdoors and under tents with stages, lighting, and seating, it is not financially viable for us to do so at this point, nor do the tent com companies have available tents since there is a huge lack of availability given the timing and number of tents that are being used at restaurants and other venues everywhere. Already the fair has committed nearly $500,000 in expenses to make the 2021 three county fair happen with no restrictions as the state has allowed since May 29. These expenses include staffing, security, public safety, entertainers and events, awards for livestock and agricultural competition, insurance coverages, licenses and permits, food and beverage concessions, merchandise, rental equipment, uniforms, and that's just the fair, not to mention the product that has been purchased or created by vendors to be sold at the fair. I am almost done. Thank you for your patience. We do not know the full damage a mask mandate will cause the fair, but it might mean the cancellation of the fair's amusement ride vendor who has operated across New England without issue since reopening began, along with many entertainment pieces that will cause the fair to lose visitors and cause the fair to refund thousands of dollars in tickets already sold. Thank you so much. I think our timer, um, Suzanne, were you timing that? I, I was, Joanne, I was just oh, about where are to- we? You know, okay. I was just about to let you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your comments. Carol Horowitz. Hi, I'm Carol Horowitz. I live in Florence and um, I know this is not on the agenda tonight, which I totally understand because I think you have a lot of discussion ahead and a lot of comments. So I'm just gonna say why I'm here and we'll take it up at another meeting. I, I'm here to ask you to endorse um, a bill in the Massachusetts legislature um, it's H926, the, um, Mass the School Children Pesticide, Pesticide Protection Act. And it's being supported by many organizations. And I'll, I'll send you more information about it, but basically what it does is it prevents uh, toxic pesticides from being used on school grounds, both public and private. And uh, we would like to see the um, Board of Health take on the pesticide industry, which has really controlled the pesticide board in Massachusetts and which approves every single pesticide that comes before it, many, many every month. And uh, we can talk more about this and I can provide you a lot more information. So thank you. I'm not gonna go into any detail here because I see how busy you are. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank we you, look Karen. forward to seeing you maybe next month. Karen Foster. Hi, thank you. I'm Karen Foster. I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor. Obviously, I live in Northampton. Um, I just want to speak briefly about your agenda item regarding um, the potential for an indoor mask mandate. Um, you know, obviously, I'm sensitive to the needs of the business communities and also just you're the experts and you'll, you'll be the ones threading the needle um, and with nuance as you discuss this topic and, and consider restrictions. I just wanted to advocate for those, um, you know, those under 12 who can't be vaccinated as well as those who are immunocompromised um, whose vaccines may or may not be as effective. Um, you know, I, I think that as we're heading into September, children, school children and the families of school children have certainly borne quite a bit of the brunt of this pandemic. And uh, we know that the variant is coming, spread is increasing, and getting in front of it is one way that we can make a difference. So I'm just asking you in your discussions to keep that nuance in mind. I'm sure that you will, but I just wanted to say that, um, to speak publicly to that. So thank you for your time and for your holding this meeting tonight and, and your thoughtfulness. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I do not see any more virtual hands raised. Dr. Love, uh, do you? Oh, here's one. Ezekiel? Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ezekiel, you, if you can unmute. Yes, now I can unmute. There thank you go. You. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you all, um, Board of Health and um, all of the health department employees who are here tonight for all the hard work that you're doing and have done through this whole pandemic and before it and oh it's so much um I wanted to echo what Councillor Foster was just speaking to um we have a lot of people under 12 here we have a lot of immunocompromised people we also don't know about vaccine efficacy beyond six months that much yet um without booster shots which are still being approved um and I think in 
indoor mask mandate is a really sensible, prudent course of action at this point. Um, as the previous commenter said, we are only in moderate transmission right now as of the most recent numbers, but that I think is why it's a vital time that we take some action before the transmission spikes up and it becomes impossible or much, much more difficult to trace and um, to take other measures. I think this is this is the time to put in an indoor mask mandate before um, before things get worse than they are right now and before there are more variants that we know even less about. Um, that's all. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Meredith, I see Gordon you, Grant you. and Julie Magri. Okay. Gordon, if you'd like to go first. Hold on, you're muted, hold on. There you go. Good evening, my name is Gordon Grant. I'm here to speak against the idea of reinstating the mask mandate in Northampton. 73 days ago, the Board of Health rescinded the state of emergency and all COVID-19 related mandates. I find it highly curious that in spite of the total number of deaths attributed to COVID-19 during these 73 days being exactly one, you now feel an urgency to bring back a mask mandate. It even begs the question, what would be the motivation for such a move now? Recently, I've heard in the media many lament that we do not have an easy way to tell who is vaccinated and who is not vaccinated. And I have wondered if the everybody must wear a mask approach is a precursor to everybody must wear a mask who is not vaccinated, i.e. anyone who cannot produce proof of vaccination, ideally on a special mobile app. Is that a reactive or conspiratorial thought? Such a system is in place in numerous countries around the world and being used on a limited basis in the US already. I would like to ask the board tonight if it can reassure the community by, def by definitively stating that a vaccine pass will not be implemented in Northampton. If you cannot do so or are privately harboring such plans, I strongly urge you to do some further thinking through of this matter. The concept of separating people by way of different sets of rights for one group over another based on health criteria has a dark and a dangerous history. Please take a step back from the slippery slope you may be on and reject, the, reject reinstating the mask mandate in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, next, Julie Magri. Hi, this is Julie Magri. I'm a retired physician. And um, I wanna thank you for meeting because obviously the situation has changed. I want, oh, thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to speak in favor of the, the board considering reinstituting the mask mandate. I would like to specifically address one statistic I heard from the representative of the county fair, and that is that 70% vaccination coverage should be adequate for her, herd immunity. Um, you probably know more than I do about this, but uh, it's that I think was for the original uh, virus, not for the Delta variant, which has a, um, a much higher R naught. And so it's thought that um, a higher level of vaccination in the community is required to keep that variant from running rampant in the community. And I would just point out, as, as you know, um, Hampshire County is not an island. And so we are bordered by I believe Ham Hamden County has substantial transmission, but in any event, um, you know we're not an island. And if you and if you decide based on the data that that a mask mandate is not um, is not the right thing to do right now, um, I, you know I'm, I know that you'll be watching the data and you'll be looking to see if the situation um, has changed. I'd like to um, just echo what the two. Uh, the counselor um, spoke about, and uh, I think the gentleman whose name was Ezekiel, the idea of protecting children too young to be vaccinated um, by reinstituting an indoor mask mandate. I believe it was just today in the New York Times, there was an article about children being affected by long COVID, children who didn't have a chance to be vaccinated being affected by long COVID. It can be devastating, right? So, um, and I think the dilemma you're in is that it seems like you can either reinstitute an indoor mask minutes sooner or later, and maybe you want to do it sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also see um, a bud. 
Bud, Bud and somebody Bud Racine. Hunter. Racine. We'll go with Bud first. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Bud Nicewender. I own In Spirit Crystals in Northampton. And um, I would like to say just for our personal sort of small business, um, our staff has been under a ton of pressure and stress during the pandemic. One of the biggest risks has been just sort of how much risk evaluation they're, they're doing every day. We put masks back for staff last week and as of Sunday for customers. Um, so I think we'd really side on the, the, the side of caution and also having sort of one rule across Northampton that would allow us to enforce and for customers to know what to expect a little bit more easily. Um, I think everybody knows how hard it's been to get people to work during the COVID times. It's, it's really a personal risk for many people. So I think the safer we can keep our staff, the more likely we are to be able to stay open as a business and keep our hours up. Um, so that's sort of our side of it. Great. Thank you, bud. Thank you. Uh, Carla Racine, I think. You see? Hi, her? I'm here. Um, I'm calling to represent, I'm here in the Zoom meeting to represent the gig economy, which has been hardest hit of all of the economies. That means all of the music, all of the acting, all the people in the arts community, all the people that run production, all the people that own nightclubs, venues across the board. Um, a mask mandate during a time of it not being a state of emergency, not being a phase um, four, a phase 3B, 3A, two or one is um, actually, it, as I said earlier, when our state is in the lead, in the lead, for what's happening of taking care of this, it is almost like a punishment further to us. You're gonna lose our economy because these variants are gonna keep coming. So if you wanna see what makes Northampton and arts community go away, it's dying. We can't survive. I'm in the process myself of buying an entertainment establishment. The customers want to come out. We have hand sanitizer. We have masks available, a box of them. For, this, for the public to take. Some people wear their masks indoors, some people do not. I think it should be up to every individual business in this city to have a sign on their door if they wanna require one or not. But I think it is paramount to the survival of our local economy for you to leave it up to the individual businesses to require a mask or not within the premises and follow the state's lead in the country on how they're handling it instead of destroying our economy we're going to lose our economy we are already losing our economy and these variants are not going to stop this is not going to go away this is the long haul but what will happen is that every business in town that involves someone's face being involved will be shut down people cannot perform with masks on people cannot sing with masks on people there are people that just don't want to wear masks and like you said, we're not even in a phase. We're not in a state of emergency. And we're at the tip of the arrow as far as being preventative. So I think we need to strongly watch how what a leader Massachusetts is and follow that before we destroy our local economy. Because I will tell you right now, the entertainment industry in this city is dying. There is nothing, barely nothing left to it. We just reopened on Friday. We just reopened on Friday after being closed the entire time so thank please you so I do much. Support this. thank you thank you everyone are there any more hands up i do not see any would anyone else like to speak during public comment okay andrew you can unmute yourself andrew all right i'm unmuted you guys hear me Yes. Yep. Thank you, uh, Andrew. I own a highbrow restaurant uh, downtown. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Meredith and her team for their diligent work. Um, I had a couple of times that I needed to call them and thank you so much for everything you've done guide through these very strange times. Um, I kind of stand in the middle a little bit leaning more towards um, opposing the mass mandate uh, in Northampton. Uh, the reasoning behind my opinion is um, if we we force people to wear masks in Northampton and the surrounding communities do not, 
um, some, a, a major, not a majority, I, I don't know how many people, but there's a chance that a percentage of the people that would be coming to our businesses will go to other surrounding communities um, and avoid coming to our tents. That's pretty much all I have. And again, I, and I, and I, I, I mean, we just, it was been a tough couple of years and I'm all about whatever you guys decide we need to do, but I kind of think that we should stick with the state mandates and kind of do something on that journey. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and Meredith, thank you so much for all you've done. I really do appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Does anybody else uh, want to speak for co public comment? I don't see any more hands. Physical hands or virtual hands? Anybody else? I think we're set. Thank you everyone for speaking. We appreciate your, your coming forward and coming tonight. Um, board members, would anyone like to make a motion uh, maybe in um, about opening a board meeting? Move to open the meeting. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, roll call, Cynthia? Uh, aye. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, so it is, it is 553. This is the Northampton Board of Health um, meeting. We, this meeting is being recorded on Zoom. Um, and tonight we have present all of our board members, Suzanne Smith, Cynthia Swopis, Lauren Levy, and myself. We also have a director of the Northampton Department of Health, Meredith O'Leary and our clerk of the Department of Health, um, Kelly Constantine. We also have with us two um, of our favorite nurses, um, our Board of Health, uh, Department of Health nurses, Kate Kelly and Vivian Franklin, who will present um, some data for us. Um, Dr. Levin? Yes. Before we go into the presentation and approving minutes, I'd also like to introduce our new uh, assistant director, Amy Hutchins. She's with us tonight. Amy, if you can unmute and say hello. Let me see if I... There you are. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for letting me join in. Um, I am new in my position as... Uh, the assistant director, I'm happy to be here. I'm going to support the staff and going forward, take what I've learned so far working for the health department and from other previous uh, positions I've had and support and lend a hand in something that uh, definitely is growing and continues to grow. So thanks for um, having me. Nice to meet you. We look forward to working with you more. Amy was hired, I believe, last October as um, a, a, as an inspector, and she was promoted, took her position probably two weeks ago. Is that correct, Amy? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. So congratulations to you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, Meredith, do you want to start with minutes, or we put those to the back? Let's put them to the back. Okay. Uh, so let's start with a presentation from our nurses, Primo incredible nurses who worked so hard this year um, and are so talented and knowledgeable. Kate Kelly and Vivian Franklin, I think they have a presentation for us. Yep. Let me see if I can get my screen shared for you. Do I need to do something, Viv? My PowerPoint's not sharing. Is it open? I'm gonna try something different. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Kate, can you screen share? Do you have it? Love technology when it works. Oh, I have it almost there, about to work. Here we oh, go. There, there we go. go. Getting there. 
I'll just tell you when to change the screen. Beautiful. Great. Okay, so um, I'm Vivian Franklin. I'm one of the public health nurses and I've been largely the lead on managing COVID-19 cases in Northampton and um, contact tracing for COVID-19. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of our data tonight, um, including community transmission locally, um, vaccination coverage, breakthrough cases we've been seeing, and a little bit about the Delta variant. So you can change the slide. So we've been hearing a lot about the Delta variant. Um, first and foremost, uh, variants are expected, especially with the coronavirus. There's been a lot of variants of SARS-CoV-2. Um, only four of them have been classified as variants of concern, and Delta variant is the most recent variant of concern. Um, what is notable about this variant is it's very much trans more transmissible than other variants, including the B117 variant that we had back in April and May. It has quickly surpassed our other variants and it's become the predominant circulating variant. It now accounts for over 90% of all cases in the country and at least 85% of those in the state. So vaccination is going to be our best prevention against further viral mutation and against the spread of infection. Um, we know that Delta variant is more transmissible, um, especially on, among unvaccinated individuals, but we are seeing breakthrough infections with this variant. Um, it can be transmitted by, transmitted by fully vaccinated individuals, but fully vaccinated individuals um, may be contagious for a short amount of time and are less likely to be infected infected according to preliminary data. It may cause more severe illness than other variants as well, and the data is still preliminary on that as well. We do have Delta variant confirmed in Northampton. It's not really surprising considering this is the predominant strain in the country and in the state. Um, we do not have testing for every single person who tests positive for COVID-19. We're not automatically testing them for Delta variant. Um, so we don't have um, really complete data on that, but based on the knowledge that it's predominant strain in the state and based on the knowledge that we have it in Northampton, we can kind of assume that it's accounting for the majority of our cases as well. And you can go to the next slide. Um, we have definitely seen an increase in cases. We actually went just about a month with zero cases, which was really exciting. Um, and then we just like the rest of the country and just like the state have seen an uptick recently. Um, just in the past 14 days, we've had 17 new cases, um, which brings our incident rate up to about four cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, in Hampshire County, we are still sitting with moderate transmission. <coughs> but we are the only county in the state that remains at moderate transmission. We are surrounded by neighbors that are experiencing substantial and high transmission. Um, like somebody said during public comment, we are not an isolated island. We are um, a travel destination. We're going to be welcoming back students in less than a month's time from all over the country and the world. Um, we also have many patrons and many employees who live in other surrounding counties. I'll just um, jump in here. Um, my other uh, and my other hat uh, I wear is um, as the medical director of infection prevention at Cooley Dickinson, um, and I'm um, got the green light to share with you our data from Cooley Dickinson. These are from the Cooley Dickinson test sites. Um, this is a graph of our percent positivity, um, and so this graph starts in October, last October, uh, when we were fairly low, and shows the increase. Uh, to when we peaked um, in early January at a rate over 8% um, and how that quickly came down over time and then over time. Um, and then we did have um, a lovely few weeks in June where we had zero cases. Um, but the trend, as you see on the bottom right of the graph, uh, the trend shows a very acute angle up 
um, with uh, our percent positivity um, just last week at about 2.5 percent. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Um, I just want to fill in here. Um, you, we can look at since this pandemic did begin in March 2020, um, it became a more kind of even distribution of cases. At first, we saw many of our cases were much older individuals, which could largely be explained by the fact that tests were really only available at that time to much older individuals. Um, and then it, the distribution did spread out to include other age groups. Um, and then we saw younger folks kind of taking the lead. And recently in this recent wave that we've been starting to experience, um, a large percentage of our cases are made up by the age group between 20 years old and 39 years old. So um, I do wanna talk about the elephant in the room, which is breakthrough cases. Um, we are experiencing and seeing breakthrough cases. So that same breakthrough case occurs when somebody who um, was vaccinated with any vaccine series received their final dose of that series um, or their single dose of the Janssen vaccine over two weeks ago and they've tested positive for COVID-19. Um, so we do pay close attention to breakthrough cases in Northampton, um, including looking for trends that are um, concerning. So it's not on its own concerning that um, we're seeing breakthrough cases. We know that vaccines are not 100% foolproof and breakthrough cases are expected. They can and they do happen. Um, we know that since July 1st, the proportion of our cases that are attributed to breakthrough cases is higher than the proportion of our cases <laughs> that are attributed to unvaccinated individuals. Um, what's important to really acknowledge though is that the majority, a higher percentage of our population is vaccinated than are not. So if we actually look at our incidence rate, say for the last 14 days, we're, we're seeing a higher incidence of infection still among unvaccinated people than we're seeing among fully vaccinated individuals. And then we can look at clinical data too. So we know that vaccines are really effective in preventing severe illness, including hospitalization and death. So we have, we do have a small percentage of our fully vaccinated individuals who have required hospital level care. Um, we have not seen any breakthrough cases that resulted in fatality. Um, whereas we've seen many unvaccinated cases that resulted in severe infection, ICU admission, hospitalization and fatality. Um, recently, we have seen more fully vaccinated people who are experiencing symptoms. In Northampton, as I've said, we have really excellent vaccine coverage. Um, at least 76% of our um, population have at, at least one dose, and that's for our total population. So if we look at our population who have, can actually be vaccinated, our 12 years and up population, um, we know that 83% uh, of them have had at least one dose. 68% of our population is now fully vaccinated. And that's 74% of our fully vaccinated, uh, our eligible population are fully vaccinated. And then we can look at Hampshire County too. So um, Hampshire County is a little bit lower overall than Northampton. Um, and then Massachusetts is kind of about the same. I don't have as much data for the eligible population, unfortunately. So now we can look at age groups, um, which is important. Uh, it's important to remember with any, um, any situation involving public health, we're really only as well protected as our most vulnerable populations. So if, you know, if our vaccine um, coverage isn't consistent across the age groups, we do need to acknowledge that. So um, we have really great vaccine coverage for our older populations. And then our 12 to 15 year olds just went out and got it. Some of them on their 12th birthday just went out and got the vaccine, which is great. Um, we do have some lower coverage for our 16 to 19 year olds and our 20 to 29 year olds. And this is actually school data. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit outdated. So these numbers are likely to be higher. 
But the good news is, is they're really already very high. So our middle school and high school vaccine coverage, uh, middle school is 74% and high school is 79%. Um, the reason why we have no data on elementary is because most of our elementary schoolers are going to be 11 years old at oldest, so they are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. Um, this data, too, is only um, surrounding students. It does not factor in staff. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Kate Kelly and I am the other nurse with the health department. Um, just a couple quick notes about vaccination. I know that it's come up in the public comment and Vivian's um, mentioned this data. Um, as many people know, we've been vaccinating here in Northampton since the very first day we were able to, which was January 11th, um, with very good results, but this pandemic is not over. We're still out at three regular clinics each week, um, really talking with people, sometimes people who've put this off for a variety of reasons, um, who are still very nervous. We're far from fully vaccinated and we don't yet have herd immunity. Um, so it's really important that we keep going with this um, and keep protecting our friends and neighbors. Um, if you know folks who are not vaccinated but would like to be, here's a list um, that I would be happy to share with you over email if you email me of our three regular clinics here in Northampton. And then as you can see, because um, on the map, it matters to us that the places surrounding us are not all the same color or the same current incidence or prevalence categories. We are reaching out to our neighbors and saying yes to helping with clinics in other places. So we do have some friends out in the hill towns and um, in surrounding counties who've invited us to come help them keep trying to reach more folks to get vaccinated. And then um, I just included at the end here, just trying to tie together at this point, all the things that we know, um, this is maybe an overused image at this point, but we um, we have so many layers to protect each other. We've already been on the leading edge of this, and I think we have an opportunity now um, to continue that, to continue vaccinating, possibly to continue um, with more masking until such time as it is not needed. Um, as you can see, vaccines are on one end and masks are over here and all of these other things we've learned through the pandemic create the Swiss cheese that hopefully when you pile it together leaves fewer holes for the vaccine to go through. Thank you so much, Kate and Vivian. Uh, you've done so much great work this year and we appreciate your coming tonight. Uh, does anybody uh, from the board have questions for Kate or Vivian? Cynthia? Um, yeah, two questions. Um, what percent are we considering to be um, herd immunity at this point? Uh, you said we had 74% in Northampton and maybe 64% in Hampshire. What would the number be for herd immunity? I am under the impression that the jury is still out on that with this particular virus and especially seeing that um, we're experiencing, we're definitely noticing more breakthrough infections with this new variant. I don't know that it's as simple as um, setting a percentage and saying that that's herd immunity. I think the state set a, a benchmark early on, like a benchmark goal, and that was interpreted to be a herd immunity goal. Um, when we're kind of seeing that that's not really the case. Unfortunately, I think the bar just keeps getting higher with Delta. And um, the, the other question is our process and procedure. If an employee at one of our establishments that the public is, um, um, a public establishment like a restaurant, if an employee tests positive in one of those establishments, do we hear about it? or not? We might hear about it. What's that process? And um, what do you mean by we? You mean Northampton if the person doesn't, li yeah. doesn't live in Northampton, but they work in Northampton? Yes, yes. But the business establishment is in Northampton. I, I understand there's been some closures. And I don't know if that's due to staffing that isn't available or positive. I, I don't know, Meredith, if you can address that or if anyone else. 
Sure. When we were under state of emergency, that was indeed embedded into many of our orders that we had that any business that had a positive employee had to contact the Board of Health within 24 hours to give us notice so we could open up the investigation. Because there often is a delay by the time that the lab results get to the state and the state reports to the community that the person lives in and then they connect with the actual Board of Health that they work in, we wanted to be able to jump on this so we could contain, you know, start containment efforts. Um, that no longer is in a Northampton policy, but something to consider if we are thinking about indeed having policies again, that um, we have our businesses report to us. I do have to say, for, uh, our businesses have been really good and reporting any positives to us, which has been extremely helpful. Yeah, I second that. Our businesses, even without the state of emergency, um, for the most part, um, can definitely give me a call and do definitely give me a call if they have questions about um, recommendations surrounding best practices. And then if they um, do have employees who test positive, it does happen. Um, and the policy, the procedure at that point, if they do call me, is I will absolutely help out with um, walking them through possible workplace exposure. Um, and if any close contacts are identified in the other, uh, other employees, Mm -hmm. um, then we can figure out how to get them quarantined and set up with testing. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly in the business's best interest to contain an outbreak earlier mm -hmm. and get the Board of Health involved and try to contain <laughs> things rather than letting things go. Absolutely. So I would hope that they um, would contact you. Thank you. Yeah. Lauren? Yeah, could you, what's the proportion, what's the number of people getting tested now? versus the number of people that were tested, say, in the winter or spring? And is it the same group? Are they uh, campuses, business doing, doing uh, continuing to do routine testing or are they far less testing now? I know we're talking about rates, but I'm trying to get a sense for who's getting tested now versus earlier. You're talking about the Cooley data I showed you? Um, we, could, we could answer that in the Cooley data, for example, and then if there's some other source of information. Um, so, at, at Cooley in particular, uh, it's a very mixed group. I can say, uh, if we want to bring up that slide again, I think the data is on the left. It, um, we're seeing definitely seeing more testing in the last few weeks um, compared to where it was before. Um, <clears throat> it's a mixed group. There are some people who have routine testing before a procedure. There are people who have it for travel reasons. There are people who have it for because they have symptoms. And I, I do have access to that data, but I didn't present it here. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the number of tests done on this data, but I do have that available. But I can, I'm pretty sure uh, it's gone up dramatically in the last few weeks. And I can just quickly share with you uh, the DPH's trends, what they're seeing, let's see. I just pulled up their report from yesterday. So if we look at um, their testing trend, we can see at least the rates. And if we go back to May, what we were looking at um, compared to, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, but these are rate, okay. But that doesn't really, that's an interesting, I'm just curious about the number of tests administered. Well, we're definitely seeing overall we're seeing more tests now than we were seeing back in say June. Um, okay. That number has gone up, but we are not seeing, I don't think nearly as much. We were seeing like 12,000 tests over two weeks back um, even as late as April. Um, and that was largely because there was a lot more screening testing going on at workplaces and also at the college. Um, whereas now that screening testing wouldn't really be going on as much. So what I'm trying to get at is, are we seeing, you know, if we were to test the same way we were testing, say, back in the winter, as kind of a random sample of people, what would, how different would that rate be? It is now, are we testing people because they think they may have it, and therefore we, we biasing the sample towards people that are more likely to be sick? That, that's just trying to, what I'm trying to get at. I think that's uh, 
next to impossible to get at because that denominator keeps changing. The mix of asymptomatic, symptomatic, free travel. Last August, it was like so many people doing testing for pre-travel. Um, it's that that denominator just keeps moving around. So I think that would be a really hard thing to tease out. Any other questions for Vivian or Kate from the board members? I can't see Susan. Oh, Susan, I can't see you. Um, okay. Um, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. We appreciate all your work. Um, Meredith? <coughs> yep. Okay. Vivian, Kate, thank you so much for presenting that data. Um, though I've been on vacation for the past couple of weeks, because I've been watching the trends and talking to the public health nurses um, quite often, just to kind of keep a pulse on what's going on um, in Massachusetts, in the region, in the county, and obviously specifically here in Northampton. And as Kate showed us that Swiss cheese model, I really feel like we, add, we need at this point to start talking about adding another layer back into our prevention strategies to help reduce the risk of, of spread of COVID disease. I know this can be a huge inconvenient to some people um, and for that I'm sorry, but I feel like if we can get our vaccination rates even higher and we put a mask mandate for indoor public spaces that this will actually curb for having any more drastic measures being taken in the future. So I, I really encourage the board to think about um, having an indoor space mask mandate for the city of Northampton public places. And so in light of all of this information, I provided you earlier today with a draft order that um, I put together. And if you guys can just by show of hands, let me know if you got that and were able to review it prior to the meeting. Okay. I can also share my screen if you'd like me to, but um, in essence, what that order says, anywhere public indoor space that the, uh, regardless of vaccination status, that the city of Northampton Board of Health requires you to wear a mask. And then there are a few exemptions in that order. Um, kiddos under five, if you are, you know, there's a medical reason, so on and so forth. So I'm asking the board today to um, look at this order, this draft order, and to discuss it. And perhaps even if you feel so inclined to have a vote on whether or not you want to enact this policy. Joanne, it's, Su it's Suzanne. I'm so yes. sorry the video's not working and I'm not going to try to fiddle up with okay. it. I'm afraid I'll disconnect. Yep. Um, I, I think we have, a whole lot more information now than we did a month ago. And for folks who think that Massachusetts has been leading the country, unfortunately, we also re recently led the country in an outbreak and the outbreak, which gave us some troubling information about the state of the pandemic. And that's in Provincetown, where in one long weekend, they had uh, super spreading through town that resulted in over a thousand cases and 75% of the people who tested positive had been immunized. So we don't really, this is, a, this is a different organism. This is essentially a new pandemic. The rules that we had before, things about herd immunity, they don't apply anymore. Over 90% of Provincetown residents were immunized before that, that outbreak. It didn't stop the outbreak. So um, the, the parameters that we were using before simply don't hold anymore and we have to amend things as we go forward. Um, we, we, are, we, we don't have large indoor dance um, venues like they do in Provincetown, but we, we are a destination and we do have venues where people do um, uh, come in in larger numbers than we had before. 
based on what we learned from Provincetown, I don't think we have the luxury of waiting to see if our numbers increase. That could happen over a weekend and, we, and it would be beyond our ability to intervene as we would now. So I, I, I don't think we have any choice but to try to intervene now when we can. It, it, the Provincetown situation has showed us that it, things can change overnight and that immunization rates aren't really helpful when you're talking about super spreading and that people who are vaccinated can spread the, spread the organism to others and be unknowing about taking it home to their kids and those who are susceptible. So we won't, we won't be able to, to follow data and, and then sit down a couple weeks later and think that we're going to intervene in a way that's meaningful as it would be now. Thank you. Any other comments? Cynthia? Uh, just a question. Um, Meredith, how is, um, I, we, we have this great track record of working with the surrounding communities. Have you spoken or has anyone spoken to the Amherst East Hampton? Um, yes. And other yes. communities and the direction that they're going in? So East Hampton is putting out an advisory tonight and they're waiting for the status of Hampshire County to change to um, the next level before they do an actual order. So they're holding tight until, you know, um, what, what is it significant or moderate right now until Hampshire County goes significant. And as um, there's actually this very cool um, model of the map uh, for risk of disease, um, you, it, it changed so quickly. Last week, you know, only half of the counties, uh, there was only like one county that was red, the rest were yellow or um, very low risk, low to moderate risk. And it seemed like every 24 hours there was a new red or high risk um, county. So it's changing very fast. So I agree um, if we were to do something in, in terms of prevention um, that we'd have to do it now because I fear, you know, in another couple of days, our level will also change. So, but to answer that, East Hampton is going to put out their advisory tonight and wait until we change to significant. And Amherst um, reached out to me last week to see what we were doing. And it sounded like they were gonna follow suit. I haven't had a follow-up conversation with them. And just one more question. I know you advised the school committee and the school committee and DESE does their own thing, but based on the, the Delta variant and this proposed policy, um, do you see any changes that the school should be taking? They're moving in a direction of fully um, masking children and, and staff members. Um, do you see any, any impact on Delta for them? So this would cover the schools too. Um, the policy would cover the schools. And I had a conversation with um, one of the superintendents and he fully supports this. Um, and it actually helps because they were thinking about the same thing. And so having oh. a universal policy was indeed helpful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. As far as businesses are concerned, I think we've placed an unfair um, burden onto businesses since the recommendation became for unvaccinated individuals to mask and those who were vaccinated to have optional masking. That left it as the responsibility of individual businesses to try to enforce something for which they had no data. Um, they couldn't tell by people walking in the door whether or not they were vaccinated. And I have some anecdotal uh, information that that made it very difficult for people to know what to do um, and how to best protect themselves and their customers. So I think by clarifying this, it would actually um, be very helpful for many businesses to stop having to make those decisions and determinations themselves. Um, I, have, I have a few questions. Um, 
first off, if we set aside the Provincetown uh, event, do we have other evidence of clusters and how things were transmitted uh, based on the case that we have in this county or elsewhere in the state? Do we have other case? I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Are you asking if we have other outbreaks that involve fully so vaccinated individuals? I only hear about the province down super spreader, uh, which is well and fine. But I'm trying to hear with, do we have other such events that have occurred, you know? Like clusters that, that we you're can, asking. Hmm? You're asking about clusters? Yes. And like, okay. if do we have clusters and, you know, reported, documented, detailed case of clusters that have occurred as a result of a super spreader event, that's not, um, that's not the Provincetown case. Here in Northampton, um, not, not to that degree. Um, I think that that received such high profile attention because it involved so many people and a lot of individuals who were traveling from all over the country. Um, and it involved a lot of people who were fully vaccinated. Um, so I'm not sure that I have information on, a, on an outbreak that has occurred to that scale. But so we, do have clusters. Just, we are investigating a cluster right now, um, workplace cluster. Viv, I don't indoor. want to you. Yeah. Huh? In uh, Northampton. Indoor. Yeah. Right. In well, Northampton, indoors. And indoors. we have an indoor, much smaller scale, relatively speaking, to the province town. We do have a smaller scale workplace cluster involving employees that have mixed vaccination statuses. Um, and over 50% of them were fully vaccinated at the time of infection. Um, and all of them uh, did become symptomatic and there's evidence of transmission between fully vaccinated, unvaccinated, fully vaccinated, and fully vaccinated, unvaccinated, fully vaccinated. In that. I'd like to just clarify, thank you Vivian. I'm just clarified that throughout this pandemic, we have seen many, many clusters <laughs> and Meredith can, can speak to them. We have not publicized them. We certainly want to protect people's privacy. Uh, but many different situations where there have been clusters outside of, you know, many, many families. Families were the first, the, the major kind of cluster, uh, but there have been many other groups um, that have caused um, clusters of infection. Uh, Meredith, do you want to speak to that a little bit? So, right. We, I mean, that's the kind of data that we're looking for, you know, to see what, where it's happening, how it's happening, how it's spreading. And a good portion of our time, Lauren, to speak to what you're asking was workplace transmissions. Um, that's, you know, after the initial what, lockdown and people began to, things started to open up. Um, we had a lot of workplace transmissions happening where we'd have large clusters. Again, not in scale to the Providence event that's happening right now, but pretty large scale relevant to the size of our businesses here in town. Would you be able to, I know we, in the public comment, we heard a few comments from business owners and my, my sense is that overall uh, was kind of split down the middle, but do any of you at the health department have heard other comments from businesses and what, what the position is? Uh, is this a relief to them that there's a mask mandate because they won't have to, Come up with their own guide guidelines, and that will just go ahead and do it. Or is this a? Uh, it's being conveyed as difficult for their operation and business, and a sub potentially substantial financial loss. Mm -hmm. Could you convey that to to me? Yep. So I've heard. Um, so this hit the paper mid last week, and I've heard from a couple businesses and from Amy Keeling from the DNA who um, had a couple of her businesses speak to her directly and she parlayed the message to me. So it's definitely a mixed bag. There's a lot of our business in, businesses in town, I, I don't know the percentage, have re been requiring a mask 
upon entry anyway. So they're glad to see something universal across the city happen. People um, had reached out to me and thanked us for even having a conversation about this because they, they want the mask mandate, but were afraid to ask their customers because they would lose customers. So there's this balancing act that's happening. Um, so there is a sigh of relief from many, but then there is this other you know, sigh that they're afraid people will take their business elsewhere. So it is definitely a mixed bag. I'm hoping that, you know, our countywide partners will follow suit and do the same thing. So it kind of levels the, the playing field for at least Hampshire County. And you can see this starting to trend in other counties too. I think Greenfield's having a conversation right now. Springfield is doing it incrementally. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. Um, we always tend to be a little, you know, leaders in uh, region one, and um, I'm proud of that. Um, so what, what about I, other, what about other cities in town out east, Middlesex County and so on? I really don't have my pulse on that, Lauren. I really, I, I tried to disconnect as much as I could um, the past couple weeks and keep my focus right here, um, but I'd be happy to do a little research on that. I don't know if Viv or Kate have anything to add. I'm going to be honest, I also was a little bit unplugged for the last week. Um, I will say I was traveling in Eastern Mass and um, most places that I went indoors in terms of um, to pick up food or to, um, to pick up something else. I didn't honestly stay indoors anywhere, but um, it was very common to see people wearing masks and um, and I wasn't even keeping track of which towns were uh, making you do it or not. Um, I was just doing it indoors and other people seemed to be also. I don't think it was out of the ordinary to be wearing a mask, but I wasn't keeping track of who had what policies. Um, I will <laughs> Side note, just say that I, I remind everyone that all these workers also go home to someone so they could have children who can't be vaccinated or spouses um, who might be even compromised. So I just don't want to lose sight of those family members. Oh, I just wanted to add um, that in the past several days, um, towns like Cambridge Belmont, um, Nantucket, and of course, Provincetown did is issue man mask mandates. So it does seem to be trending in that direction for a lot of these larger towns. And those, um, those counties are in the orange or the red by the CDC map where the CDC recommends it, but can't mandate it. <clears throat> um, any other questions for Vivian or Kate or other comments about this and maybe we can uh, move to the actual document. You want to go there? Does everybody have it? Yes. Yes. Um, one, one a couple more questions. I'm sorry. Yep. Would, would you remind, uh, would you remind me of the rest of the board of the, the current position of CDC and the Commonwealth? What do you mean the by position? current recommendation of CDC when it comes to mask indoors and the position of the Commonwealth DPH at Massachusetts DPH? I can tell you the CDC recommendation is that all unvaccinated, my understanding is that all unvaccinated people uh, mask indoors and vaccinated people should mask indoors if they are in the substantial or high category. Um, there is one other thing that happened in the last few days. Does anybody remember? One other new, if um, I can't remember. I believe the latest recommendation um, couched it as um, local authorities should consider um, stronger mass mandates. It, it did not give specific recommendations. Um, left it still to, to um, localities to do that. Would, would you see... like me to read you Massachusetts statement? Sure. Please. 
Effective July 30th, the Department of Public Health has issued a new mask advisory in light of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's updated guidance. Fully vaccinated individuals are advised to wear a mask or face covering when indoors and not in your own home if you have a weakened immune system or you are at increased risk for severe disease because of your age or an underlying medical condition, or if someone in your household has a weakened immune system, is at risk that is at increased risk for severe disease or is an unvaccinated adult. Masks are still mandatory for all individuals on public and private transportation systems, including ride shares, livery, taxi, ferries, MBTA, commuter rail, and transportation stations, in healthcare facilities, and in other settings hosting vulnerable populations, such as congregate care settings. That's the uh, statement from DPH last week. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. Um, I, I was also curious is some places, I know New York seems to have issued a, a vaccine mandate. You have to show proof of vaccination if you're going to go to a restaurant. Anything of that nature taking place in Massachusetts that, or other places? And, and is that something that has been brought up anywhere? Is that something that's under consideration? Uh, a vaccine mandate, or at least uh, if, if, if you want to go inside a, a restaurant, for example, a pub, you have to show proof of vaccination, much like you have to show proof that you're 21, at least 21 and older. So I know um, MDPH just put out um, a requirement that you have to be vaccinated to work in long term health care facilities. Um, so that's new and that's awesome. Um, I do know there are certain businesses that are requiring it at this point, Laurent, but I don't think it's being talked over universally yet in the state of Massachusetts. That's Cooley Dickinson mandates it. It um, Cooley Dickinson is part of the Mass General Brigham system, and we will be mandating it. It's not mandatory at the moment, but probably by the end of the year. I don't know what the date exact dates are, but um, they're moving forward with that. Yes. And any idea when the, 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 the vaccine they're going to be, I think there was in the work something like the, within, within, by the end of the month, the, the authorization of the, at least the Pfizer vaccine was going to be permanent or uh, uh, not, no longer temporary. Yeah, Tony Fauci said he thinks by the end of August. Okay. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of institutions were waiting for that before mandating that their employees get vaccinated. Um, but um, because of Delta, I think some other institutions like uh, Mass General have just moved forward anyway, uh, expecting that that was gonna come eventually and uh, time, of, time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. um, just a question of as a board, would we be allowed to uh, require that someone in Northampton has to show proof of vaccination when going in a restaurant? Or would, we be, would that be feasible, much like New York? We do have the authority to set policy if it were to protect public health. Okay. The, the enforcement of that is extraordinarily problematic. Well, somehow they managed to ask for, uh, for an ID when you walk in a pub. So mm -hmm. I don't know how complicated that is. Well, New York State is uh, just rolling out their app. And for people who are immunized within New York State, it's sort of their immunization data sort of flows right into the app. But for people who are immunized outside of the state or outside of the country or the county need to show proof, you know, they can show your little card. I think they're really not sure how to manage all those outliers who were vaccinated in another state and things like that. So I think, and it has yet to go into effect. Um, so we'll see what they, what kind of trouble they run into and how they, how they fix it. Because it strikes me as something that needs to be coordinated at a much larger scale than, say, the city of Northampton, 30,000 people. It's true. I agree. <clears throat> um, any other comments? Do you want to take a look at the, the uh, proposal, uh, Meredith? Does it make sense to put it on the screen so we can all look at the same section at the same time? Sure. Uh... Hmm. 
<laughs> you have to figure oh, no. this out. <laughs> Holy, what is Whoa, that? Oh, what did you do? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I have no idea. Stop, wow. stop. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> <gasps> it's wow. light in the mood a little bit there. Uh, let me try that again. Let's see. While Meredith's finding that, I have one more comment about um, Morat's question. Um, just another okay. local okay. point of interest is that I believe UMass. Uh, announced today that their employees will be required to vaccinate. Could you say that again, Kate? Um, just another comment about your question. I believe that UMass announced today that all of their employees, um, their faculty will be required to be vaccinated. I don't know what the process is for verifying that or Here we go. You could zoom it the double double space. Um, if you go to view on your top menu. Um, yeah. Make it 200 maybe. Well, you're at 100 already. I am? Okay. Yeah, so that's normal. So go to 200. <coughs> and scroll up a little bit. All right, so um, the beginning of this document, uh, well, Meredith, do you wanna walk us through this? So this is just the first four whereas is telling you why we're considering this, what's happening in terms of the Delta variant and um, how it is being viewed as the variant of concern right now, the prominent variant and how it's twice as contagious as previous variants. Um, and we know there is evidence that masks slow or prevent transmission of all COVID-19 variants so far. Um, so as we see the rise in surrounding counties and communities right now um, to, keep our to keep our cases low, we are therefore enacting a policy that requires you to wear a mask indoor uh, in a public indoor space. And we define what a public indoor space is. Um, Alan Seawald added this definition to this earlier today. The term public indoor spaces shall include all places in the city of Northampton into which members of the public are invited or otherwise allowed to enter a building or a structure to interact with any persons in order to transact any public or private business. And then in section one, it says um, you're required to wear a mask in a in public indoor space, regardless of vaccination st status over the age of five years. Um, the mask must cover your nose and mouth. And then it goes on to read, employees of public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton must wear a mask or face covering at all times while, I'll, while I'm the premise. Customers of public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton must wear masks or face coverings at all times while on premise. And then it tells you um, a little, you know, specs about the mask or face covering. It should fit snugly, but comfortable, be secured with ties and ear loops, multiple layers, allow for breathing, um, can be removed for eating and drinking where allowed and different kinds of masks you can wear. And then it says in that last section, the person or entity in control of a public indoor space shall have the obligation to enforce the requirements. So the businesses are required to make sure that their customers coming in, in essence, have a mask on. And then in section two of this order, um, it has exemptions for who can wear a mask. And um, so under the age of five, those who, um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my space. Anyone who has trouble breathing, et cetera, in section one, 
Um, office spaces that are not open to the public are exempt from this order, while social distance can be maintained between staff. So if you have an office with multiple employees in there sitting at their desk, they don't have to wear a mask. Um, but if they're going to get up and use the copier and they can't maintain that social distance, then you put your mask on. And then you have office spaces, and this was a little clunky as I wrote this one, um, but office spaces that are open to the public, but are in an enclosed space with a barrier between the public and the employee may be exempt from wearing a mask or face covering when not interacting with the public and the barrier is closed. So I was thinking more like dental offices or medical offices where um, you have all of your staff in an office and you have some type of barrier that opens and closes, when that's closed and no public is interfacing at that point, you don't have to wear your mask as long as you can maintain your social distance. But if the public comes in and you open up that um, plexiglass or what have you, you have to put your mask on. Now, one thing I didn't think about that was brought up during public comment is performers. If we were going to do um, enact such an order, we would want to think about performers and maybe not having them wear the mask in an indoor public space while performing, but maybe have a setback from the public. Um, but I didn't even think about that when I was um, putting this together earlier today. So that in essence is the order. And again, this was just a draft quickly drawn up today. Everyone had a little input. So Meredith, I guess I'm a little confused because the section one talks about public spaces and section two, you say exempt are private offices, but they're not a public, really a public space. I don't, I don't know how to think about private offices. Is that a public space because people go to work or is it not a public space? Where, uh, what are you looking at specifically, Dr. Levin? Like number two, this is in the section about people who um, that, that are exceptions to the rule, okay. but the rule is about public spaces. The rule mm -hmm. isn't about where you can you where do you need to wear a mask. There are public spaces. There's offices. There's this and this, this and this. Mm -hmm. The rule is about public spaces, and now you're saying there's an exception about office spaces that are not open to the public. I guess it's just a little confusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess that would be, yeah, no, um, up for the board to decide. I feel like the employees of private office spaces have the right to be protected too. Um, so maybe that would go in the top part. You know, here are the places that mm -hmm. you need to mask. Yeah. In public spaces, whether you're an employee or a uh, mm -hmm. public uh, office spaces, like list all the the places. Um, mm -hmm. I also have a question about the masks. Um, I don't think our definition of masks includes an N95 <clears throat> or a KN95. They're not, some of them are disposable. Um, and then I don't know if that would be uh, included in surgical procedural masks. That's not how we usually think of them. Mm -hmm. uh, disposable is procedural, those flat, usually blue or yellow. Mm -hmm. um, so an N95 or KN95 or something with higher filtration and a good fit uh, may be disposable or may be removable there. I mean, maybe um, um, not disposable. There are ones that are called elastomeric masks, which are very high filtration and mm -hmm. very protective. Um, so we might want to include something about that. Um, other question is, what do you envision? Um, how, do, how would this work in a gym? I think that a gym would fall under a public indoor space and you would have to wear a mask. Um, do churches and synagogues count as public indoor space? Yes. So do we have the right to, um, to make policy about that? I guess there was something on the federal level <clears throat> about our ability to do that. Earlier in the pandemic, there were issues about that. Do you, do you know? With church and synagogues? Religious uh, institutions, what, what we're allowed to regulate. I haven't heard anything different. Um, to the best of, my do best of my knowledge, we have the right to mm -hmm. do that. 
going back to type of masks, um, I think it was you, Dr. Levin, who brought up um, the vented masks. Do we? Yeah, I think we need to say masks with vents are not are not allowed and not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and for the purposes, uh, I mean, bars and restaurants are currently serving indoors and people are eating together. Um, so how would this apply to bars and restaurants? This would be as it was at one time, people mask when you're coming and going or waiting and unmask while you're eating and mask again when you get up to go to the bathroom. Is that how you envision this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the exception being when you're eating or drinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, do we, yeah, go ahead. Do, do we need to include smoking since smoking in indoor places, indoor public spaces? Spaces is not allowed? I wouldn't think so because it's not allowed. <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't. <laughs> you, well, well it, it, it says may be removed under F, uh, 3F. It says may be room for eating, eating, drinking, or oh, smoking. It does actually say smoking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a copy and a paste from our <laughs> original order, which included outdoor spaces. So you're correct. Thank you. So does where allowed goes off because otherwise is there, uh, I assume the eating and drinking doesn't need any type of authorization or. Yeah, At three F still. Mm -hmm. um, there may be stores that say no food or beverage permitted. There may be some venues that say that. So I would leave where allowed. I think there are limits to where you can walk around with your drink, at least outside of the building. Alcoholic drinks, not oh. non-alcoholic yeah. drinks. I don't think this specifies alcohol. No, it does not. Um, so I think there's a fair bit of um, work that this document would need. Um, do we want to work on this now? So if we don't have to have the document with all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, the spirit of, or the nature of the order is what's important here, Attorney Seawald would tell us. So if you itemize, you know, what you want in it, what you don't want in it, and you put a vote to, to those items, itemized pieces, then the document we can work on tomorrow, myself work on tomorrow. Um, so we could authorize you to develop the document mm -hmm. with attorney Seawald, mm -hmm. um, and finalize that. Yeah, that's great. And then we'd publish the final. But the order, the order could take place tomorrow, even though the document's in flux. I'm sorry, Cynthia, I didn't catch that. Can the order take place tomorrow, even though the document is being wordsmith? I would like people to, you know, to give um, the public 24 hours notice, you know, to get masks if they need them and just to kind of be prepared for this, the businesses and um, the public. So I would recommend to the board, at least with an effective date, 24 hours after the passing, if you so choose. Can I just ask a couple of questions? Um, sure. In section one, we're saying that we advise people to wear masks. And then when we um, are more specific in numbers one and two, we say that you um, must wear masks. And I don't know if that's just a nuance that, you know, advising is different than must wear. No, yeah. Um, and, and um, but that actually, when Kate was reading the um, mask statement, they were saying advising and they jumped into a must as well. So I think it's just a Mm -hmm. a little nuance there. Yeah. Um, and, and also the, um, we took great pains to talk to the business owner or the public place owners that they're not responsible for being a heavy here. So that leads me to, quest, uh, to ask the question, who does enforce? And will that be us going around to different places? And um, I'm assuming this will be something like if you, if you have an unruly person that doesn't want to do it, you can call 
um, the police or the board of health? Well, it would be up to the business to allow the person in if they're wearing a mask or not allow the person in if they're not wearing a mask. So that number four says person that the entity mm -hmm. that's in control of the space has to enforce it. Was it any different from what it was previously? No. Okay. Can I quickly jump in and speak on this? Yeah. Sure. I just, I do have um, Carla Racine who messaged me um, and I think that she's probably speaking on behalf of a lot of business owners who are expressing a lot of concern about um, being endangered by being put in an enforcement position with this. So I just want to acknowledge that that fear is out there. So Meredith, um, similar to Cynthia's question, if a business owner had a problem client, who would they call <clears throat> if they were, you know, they said, hey, you know, please put on your mask and they end up with some trouble. Mm -hmm. What's their next recourse? Do they call the Department of Health? Do they call the police? No, they would have to call the police. We don't have the resources for that. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, if, if someone's unruly and they don't leave, then you're talking about something that's confrontational that my inspectors aren't trained to deal with. So it would mm -hmm. have to be police. Meredith, did I understand you saying that this is essentially similar to how it was before when we did have a mask mandate, yes. this language? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> But the businesses were closed. I think that's the difference, right? No. No. Um, no, they weren't. In the beginning, they were, but then yeah. things yeah. opened up and we still had the mask mandate. Yeah. But that came from the state, right? Mm. It came from us. I thought we had the mask mandate. We did have the mask mandate. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had more specific regulations um, that we had voted on. Yeah. And it was up to the businesses. We tried to enforce the outside <clears throat> mask mandate to the best of our ability between the police and the health department. Um, but it was up to the businesses to enforce it, to be in control of their operation. Just like when, and Kate, you know, um, just like when no smoking came into effect, we had a regulation for no smoking for indoor spaces. It was up to the business to enforce that, that regulation. And do we recall the position of the chief of police on any type of enforcement that they will ultimately have to address when... Well, they're not addressing the enforcement, Lauren. They're just de-escalating the situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which I, I seem to recall was, you know, trying to offer masks and, and explain. And I agree, they seem to have addressed this always uh, in, 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 a, in the spirit of not giving away fines. I, I, I get it. But I just want to make sure they prepare to this time around when there's going to be a little bit of uh, reluctance to comply, initially at least. And is it the reality that some businesses were better at complying than others? Mm -hmm. 100%. But, you know, we worked with the businesses, educated the businesses. You know, we didn't go straight to enforcement tools that we had. Any other comments from the board members or Kate or Vivian? Uh, just the question in finances, are we in a position to supply masks to businesses? We Is have it? plenty, plenty of masks in inventory right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if a business were to need it, we could provide it. 
we could also provide universal signs for all of our businesses saying masks required per the Board of Health that they could hang up in their, you know, on their front doors or in their window to help take the onus off of them. I, I know, Meredith, you always provide, you know, we just don't lay down the policy. You always provide some guidelines and support um in in doing that so that's i think that's what i'm getting at and i'm sure we'll do that if, if we were to vote for this mm -hmm. yeah i i think as as long as you change as, as cynthia pointed out that our advice to but becomes our required so that is not not ambiguous yeah mm -hmm. i, I um, changed that to shall <laughs> as far as the office space i i i was on the impression there was it was pretty clear. I think section two, number two does indicate, it, it doesn't present this in as exemption. It just reminds people, the, the reader that the office space is not a public space, except as noted. But I don't think it's construed as, as an exemption to the above. So I, I, I think to me, I don't find this to be ambiguous. And I also would not support, you know, if, if it's a business, a private business, I'm, I'm not sure I want to start telling them what to do. Well, this does tell them, uh, section two, number two, does say that people who are working in offices do have to social distance if they don't want a mask. Um, and that may be oh. a change for some businesses. Once again, the enforcement of that is, um, I will say, problematic again. Right. If not impossible. I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, bad to have a reminder of the ongoing need to social distance um, for those who are working in office spaces where masks are not required. Ones that are not open to the public. Mm -hmm. So what this is saying though, is that <clears throat> if social distance can't be maintained, then they are not exempt from the mask mandate. So it's sort of backwards, but that That's is what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But they are office spaces not open to the public and therefore not open to us. Mm -hmm. So, right, it contradicts the term of public indoor spaces, the definition. So we should probably take it out if that's what we're, if we're gonna keep this definition because it says, shall include all places in the city of Northampton into which members of the public are invited or otherwise allowed to enter a building. Now, if you have an attorney's office and the public comes in, they wouldn't be exempt because they would fall under that definition. Um, I believe we also addressed this at, at the end of section two about mm -hmm. office spaces that are not open to the public. Mm -hmm. um, so I think perhaps we're addressing it twice and that may be adding to the confusion. Mm -hmm. Um, in section two, number three, that would be where I would suggest reminding people that um, continued social distancing is strongly advised. So take out number two of section two. Um, I think so. I think that involves offices and not the public, even though I believe that it would be in their best interest to do that. I'm not sure that's what we're aiming for here. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, plus, it seems to me that the social distance, um, I mean, what prevents two people uh, to sit at the same table if they were in mask? I, I mean, I don't know if there's an issue of social distance that's required in a private office. It's not a business start with, I agree, but even if they can't social distance, they can still wear a mask. I mean, maybe we should strike it out entirely, not get into that, I agree. Maybe it makes more sense to start with the public spaces and then we can take up other issues.
And Meredith, just to your point about when you're envisioning dentist's office and doctor's offices, they already are under a mask mandate um, because they're in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, okay. Am I allowed to speak? Sure. I know I'm not a board member. Um, I just want to throw out a couple of thoughts that I'm having as I sit here. Some of you know that my background was tobacco control policy long ago and far away, but um, I just am thinking about these sort of funny little details about back room office type workers. And we also want to be protecting them and their families and their children and their members of the public in their own right. And so, I'm just wondering about that low level worker who works for the big boss who may appreciate signage or a mandate that says they are expected to be protected with masks in their office space. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't fully know the background of how to write this in terms of um, whether part of it could be advisory to give those people a voice, but um, I realize our, we're protecting the public, but the workers are the public too, and likely some of them go home to live in our community. Um, so I don't. I know it's a little bit tricky when we did smoke-free workplace laws. We talked a lot about protecting the workers. I mean, we want these businesses to stay open, so we want the workers to be healthy too. It's not just about the public entering the workplaces. So I'm just throwing that out there. I, I don't agree know with if you. one section can be like a mandate and one section could be advisory or something like that, but I think you have a lot of power and we are behind the scenes doing contact tracing on worker outbreaks, not uncommonly. I totally agree with you and I, I do think office workers should be protected. I think it, it's a little bit complicated to write. It's probably a lot more detailed about distancing and if you sit at your desk or if you sit alone in an office or then you're walking to the copier like it's it's might be complicated to write um but i think it's um probably worth doing the question is whether we do it now or add it later and i just um put out there a comment about um, restaurants and bars being much more difficult to deal with mask wearing in a um, practical sense. Those that did change all at the same time where we had all of these capacity limits, which were really challenging. And then we had the mask mandate and those were all were kind of lifted incrementally around the same time. So to kind of go back to having a mask mandate um, without acknowledging that there's a lot of settings that are smaller and don't aren't equipped with the same level of space as say another larger restaurant, it, it actually pose a real logistical challenge with um, mask wearing. People would effectively have to take on a mask and put, off, put it on again and take off and put it on. Um, it's, you're not really, there's no really real distance between patrons in some of these settings at all. I don't think this part, the office space part really applies to restaurants. I think the vision is that employees in restaurants, they're sort of on the go and on the move would be wearing a mask the entire time. I guess I'm just commenting in general, sorry. Yeah, it was very, uh, it was it was easier when we had sector specific regulations, both on the state and the local level. Um, that would, that would parse this out better. But now we're just trying to cast an umbrella to capture everything. So I, I understand the challenges on trying to get the right language. Um, And I see your point, Viv, to the restaurants. It, it, it will be difficult, but I think the spirit of the order would be, you know, if you're not at your table consuming any type of food or beverage that you would have your mask on. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking of, especially in a bar setting, you have a lot of individuals standing with limited table space even available. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we know that that's an area that's really been hurting for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, And now a lot of people are back to, um, you know, going frequenting in those areas. Um, There's a lot of, you know, bar settings, especially where people are going to be standing and consuming their beverages because there's no table space. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of thinking through that. Mm -hmm. So they would still be exempt even standing, I guess, because if you're in a setting for which allows um, food and drink, then you are exempt while, while doing so, whether you're standard or seated, where before the sector specific regulation was, you could only eat, you could only consume when seated. We're not going there. Um, and I don't have intentions on doing that or recommending that at this point. Again, it's just, another layer to Kate's awesome Swiss cheese model that we're doing here. So does anyone want to make a motion in a more general way? And uh, Meredith can um, uh, work with attorney Sewell to uh, work on the language another time. Does anyone want to make a motion about the things we would want to in, include in um, in, a, in, a, in a, any mandate? Well, I I, I would move that we approve the concept. Um, of of requiring masks and all these new and all these places that we said we would, but um, and let me just back away from the motion. I just want to make sure it happens soon, as opposed to getting lost in the wordsmithing. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure how to um, um, word that motion. I mean, I'm a, I would approve the spirit of what we're doing here with the changes as discussed. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else disagree with that general direction or can put that in a motion. I'm yeah. wondering if we can um, make a general motion about accepting the spirit of this mandate and maybe list some of the venues or some of the situations that have been discussed that we do want to include or don't want to include in in the mandate and just sort of oh. specify some of those specific things. Lauren? Oh, sorry. I, I yeah. was wondering, can we make a motion first to delegate uh, for that order app hours to Meredith to finalize the draft so that it can be put in place without our signature individually and so on, since we're not in the same place? I think that might come second. <laughs> OK. Yes, I think we can do that. Uh, I think we, our intent is to mandate masks in public indoor spaces, except when eating or drinking and except for children um, under the age of five. I think the rest is just descriptive. I agree with all of this. I think really the, what, what seemed to be the outstanding conversation had to do with an office where the public doesn't go any, that doesn't go to, I don't know, and, and, and what, what to do about it, whether we can enforce well, certainly, whether we can't probably easily enforce, but whether we need to, whether we need to have the order extend to that, or some sort of advisory. But the yes. rest, I'm fine with it. I am as well. I think you put it well, Suzanne, um, about what the main points were. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what we're saying. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's 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 simpler than we think because we're getting lost in the yeah. weeds understandably yep yeah. um 
Um, Kelly or Meredith, do you have the ability to uh, type on the screen? Uh, maybe open a Word document and type as we, uh, as it sounds like Suzanne dictates a, um, a proposal. Type on Word, Joanne, on the policy or a motion? Uh, just maybe open a new Word document on and, and write the motion. Oh. Any co-host can. I guess I can. In the meantime, I'm just addressing Carla's uh, comment about um, the unavailability of masks. And I'm not sure if she heard that the um, health department has generous supply of masks. So I just wanted to say that. All right, would someone like to make a motion? And uh, Meredith, can you type as we, as we go? I can sure try. <laughs> okay, I move to approve. That's Suzanne, by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, move to approve um, uh, the, in, it's not the reinstatement, but move to improve, um, approve um, the- A mask mandate? Hold on. Yeah, I'm trying to make it more right difficult. Yes, a, a mask- Approve COVID-19 mandatory, yeah. yes. Yeah, that, I was trying to capture that and in, in getting lost in it. Um, that requires um, mask wearing in public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton, uh, with the exception of those who are eating or drinking and individuals over the age of five years. Under the age? Over, over the age. Oh. Requirement, uh, no, over the age, requires mask. Oh, gotcha. Oh, the exception, you're right, Cynthia. Under. Yeah, no. you're, you're, I'm sorry, I missed the exception. Uh, under the age. I'm glad you're paying attention. <laughs> um, if you include the name of that draft document, does that mean we're approving that language? Or do you want to say we approve the spirit of it? Um, and um, mm -hmm. OK. Mask wearing in indoor public spaces. Do we want to address um, indoor performers? I think we need to. Okay. Um, those who are in, in eating, drink, those, those who are performing, those with medical exemptions and individuals under the age of five years. So that would be the place those who are performing performing that's a broad def that's a that that's a we will define what performing is and we right. also need to define a setback so if you tell me what those are i can include them in the in the um order well so that's an interesting what is a performer because can i can i call myself right. a performer <laughs> <laughs> So if I'm a scheduled performer, that's fine. But what if it's open mic? Well, is it performing from a stage? It's not always from a stage. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know. I'm trying to. I think I, I, I think that's clear list. enough. 
I think that's clear enough. Of course, you know, we can argue uh, can, lots of things, but. Okay, can, can, we, can we take those who are performing out of that sentence mm -hmm. and add a second sentence that says, those who are performing um, must adhere to social, social distancing of at least, the thing is when you're performing, it's not six feet. It was 10 feet or 25, I can't remember. I was thinking it was 12. I'm pretty sure. Um, it's either 10 or 20, I think. I can look it up. Um, we could say those who, are, those who are performing are not required to mask, but must adhere. And we're talking about the distance from the audience, not the distance from their co-performers? To the public. From the public. It's a good example of a definition of an artistic performance if we want to get to that detail by um, just a Google search. Good. I was I was thinking about a very long list. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I don't want to exclude anyone. Mm -hmm. That 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 be, because of what was discussed at. The, um, at public comment about the extraordinary, um, the extraordinary uh, disadvantage that those in the arts have suffered under for the past year and a half. I was able to find the performance guidelines, previ the previous performance guidelines from Massachusetts DPH. Um, for live performances, singing and the playing of brass and wind instruments is discouraged. Singing is not permitted, blah, blah, blah. For outdoor performance, this, so these were for outdoors, but I realize we're not to that severity yet, but it was 10 feet between performers, 25 feet between performers in the first row of the audience, um, and encouraging shorter duration. That's going to be impossible in yeah. many of our indoor venues. Yep. 25 feet. But I have previously read in some guidelines about choruses. I believe it was a 10 foot distance, but I'll keep looking. Do we want to include anything about office workers? I, I, would, I would like that as an advisory. Personally. So, uh, Suzanne, this is your motion. Um, do you want to add to it, or we can have another motion after yours? Um, I, I would like to, at the bottom of this, any any member of the public. Um, I, I've been thinking of, about this since the advice was, was raised, and I, I think that it's very important to make that advisory. But I think it could become very confusing if that comes under something that has the title of mandatory policies and procedures. Um, and, and I don't know if that means it should be a, its own separate advisory or whether we include that in, in all materials, but I mean, maybe I'm overthinking this, but we're, the, it says mandatory at the top, and then we'll have something in here that's just an advisory. So I just, I want to kind of bring us back into Robert's rules that you're making a motion, yep. Suzanne. So you make the motion and then there'll be an opportunity for discussion. Um, okay. Well, the chair will allow for that. That's where the person making the motion is, is, is concerned. So mm -hmm. I because that person is, is concerned about mandatory policies and procedures, this would be my motion. 
So I'll read the motion is uh, I move to approve the intention of the draft COVID-19 mandatory policies and procedures for wearing of masks or other face coverings in public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton that requires mask wearing in public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton with the exception of those who are eating or drinking, those with medical exemptions and individuals under the age of five years. Those who are performing are not required to mask but must adhere to social distancing of at least 10 feet from any member of the public. Do I hear a second? A second. Any more discussion? Um, just more of a question is, can we move that motion and then have a second motion when it comes to that advisory about office space? Or do we need to include, do we need to have this in this discussion now? No, I think once we settle on this, if you want to make a new motion, I think that's acceptable. No, it's not. What? Because we're including, we're approving the intention of that draft order that I wrote. So now is the time under the discussion period if you want to talk about office spaces, we're mm -hmm. got to do it now. You want it all included in the same? Well, same because time. a motion was made, so we have to. We're tied no. to. That. No, a motion was made on this particular thing, and then a motion can be made on something new. No. A after we're done with this. N no, because we included that in when we wrote here, the in, when she made the motion to approve the intention of the draft, work spaces or office spaces were in that draft, Joanne. Okay. So now is the time for the discussion on that. Okay. So we either could, you know, the discussion is scrap this this motion and start over or talk about the office spaces, whether you want to include it or not include it and amend the motion. So this is the motion and it's been seconded. Um, there can be amendments. Yes, um, after your discussion. Mm -hmm. um, well, why don't we, uh, I, I, I like what I see and I, to suggest as an amendment to have an advisory. I, I don't believe it's ambiguous to the extent it's, I mean, it's not ambiguous to individual under the age of five that it's not mandatory for them. And likewise, I would say um, something along the line that it's not a requirement or a mandate for a private office. However, there's a, a, uh, a, an advisory to uh, wear mask if people cannot socially distance in, in private office when the public is, is not, uh, uh, does, does not routinely enter. So do you want to uh, state a formal amendment? Meredith, can you take dictation, please? Mm -hmm. Lauren? Um, private offices, Sorry, we could say that or office spaces that are not open to the public. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, mandatory mask wearing is not required in office spaces that are not open to the public. However. Um, so it changes the beginning of the sentence, Meredith? Yes. I missed it. What? Mandatory mask wearing is not uh, um, mandated in office space that are not open to the public. Well, it's twice the mandate. I can't put mandatory twice. <laughs> Uh, is not, we can say, is not expected or required in office space that are not to the public. However, um, 
can we say the board strongly encourage or advise? Um, mask wearing in space where um, social distancing is not possible. So I'll read that. The motion for the amendment is that mandatory mask wearing is not required in office spaces that are not open to the public. However, the Board of Health strongly advises mask wearing in spaces where social distancing is not possible. Are you happy with that, Lauren? Is there a second for this amendment? A second. Okay, any discussion? I guess the question I have is, why are we not mandating it the same as public spaces? And we have enforcement as an issue everywhere. Why would we not mandate it? Why is this one an advisory and the other one is a mandate? I think we were, were uh, I think this we were trying to honor the employees that are working in a situation that's not a public place if they feel um, uh, compromised. Is that what Kate that was your um, what you brought up, I think? It was, but I think I'm kind of this is like circle circle, it's looped back again, which I, I kind of I kind of feel like we should protect all the workers if we're protecting all the public, they're public too. Um, so it would seem to me that indoor spaces are indoor spaces, but I'm just going back to the whole indoor workspace smoking thing, which doesn't seem that dissimilar to me. Someone's doing something that could be putting someone else at risk and not know that in this case they could be an vaccinated asymptomatic and transmitting to someone who has someone at home who could be at risk. So we're correct. Yeah. Then we're not talking about public indoor spaces. I, that's I, right. I, I, Just how I, we got off. Yeah, the last right, time I, that's how it ended up being an advisory. Right, I, I appreciate your sentiment, Kate, and agree with it wholeheartedly, but then we're just talking about all indoor spaces. And I think that's, well, it's going to be impossible to enforce from the get-go. It's all impossible to enforce, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think maybe, Suzanne, maybe we shouldn't get hung up on the name of the document and maybe the document name could change, uh, but still the intent is to um, require mask wearing indoors. Um, so maybe we shouldn't get hung up on the name of the document. Is well, it I think, Sorry. I think that's a whole, I think that's a whole different, I think that's a whole different ball game to be mandating mask wearing in indoor spaces <laughs> that we have no access to. Um, and it's un unenforceable. And that then I think dilutes the impact that we could have by mandating mask wearing in public places, spaces. Well, we could do what we did with smoking and just say workplaces. I think uh, office spaces may be too specific, could be workplaces. There was a comment uh, from the public suggesting that the language be changed to public spaces and any workspace with members of more than one household. I guess there are family run businesses where people live together and they're a household anyway, but. I think workplaces would do it. 
I mean, we can't legislate a family, you know, I just, workplaces encompasses what we're talking about to protect all the workers. Um, so is there a motion to amend the amendment? We can, we can keep amending. Um, can I just change, uh, tweak the, the sentence? Instead of mandatory mask wearing is not required is simply mask wearing is not mandated in office space. Do you want office spaces or the broader workplace that was described, Lauren? Indoor workplaces? Um, or we could simply have in workspaces. Indoor. Yeah. Well, Meredith, we're really not supposed to be changing proposals <laughs> that have already been seconded. <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Same thing? it's just a language clarification or is, okay. or is so it- Where's the different? word public? Right, indoor. Uh, is that not the same thing, just clearer? No. I think public spaces is broader than workplaces. Okay. How so, Suzanne? Pardon me? How so? Well, there, there doesn't necessarily, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, but, yeah. um, it, it, it seems to me that people have a certain concept of what, what a workplace is. And that's, that hasn't been what we've been talking about. We've just been talking about the broader concept of an indoor space that's, that's open to the public. About a municipal building or a theater or a, those don't, people don't think of workspaces as theaters or right. restaurants or these are just public indoor spaces. Right. I mean, obviously people work there, but, but the most, most of the people in there are not working mm -hmm. in those examples. So I, I think that that, I think people would immediately start thinking about their own office rather than, as Joanne said, going to the theater. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I want to say that a mask mandate, um, we are not talking about um, um, capacity, changing capacities. We're not talking about distancing. We're not doing so many things. We're shutting down any venues. Uh, so many things that happened last year that we're not talking about here. We are talking about people wearing masks. That's all. We're not um, talking about vaccine passports. We're not talking about any of that. I agree, Joanne, that was good to have brought that up. So uh, we are now in the uh, motion, the amended motion, it was changed, which is not generally how it's supposed to happen. But now we have mask wearing is not mandated in indoor workplaces that are not open to the public. However, the Board of Health strongly advises mask wearing in spaces where social distancing is not possible. Um, Suzanne specifically, Meredith asked us to include language about offices. If we were going to do it, she wanted it included in, in this discussion, rather having a, a separate discussion. Um, so let's go back. Uh, this is Lawrence motion. Is there a second? Cynthia, you second the previous one. I'm just reviewing it. Yep. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion of the amendment? 
And Lawrence, your intent is to add that to the uh, original motion, right? Not to replace something, but to add. To the extent that Meredith is okay with how we're proceeding. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't explode later. Um, all right, is there any more discussion about the amendment? All right. Um, so at this point, someone would need to make an emotion uh, with the amendment included or a motion without, and then you would vote on it. I think or we vote, I think what happens is you vote on the amendment and then you vote on the amended motion. Okay. Yep, so let's have a vote on the amendment. Um, all in favor, Lauren? Uh, yes, in favor. Cynthia? Yes. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. Um, and now um, we have a motion with an amendment on the table. It's been, uh, it was a motion put forward by Suzanne. It was seconded. Um, Is there any more discussion about this motion that includes the amendment? I, I don't have any comment except it's for all in favor since we still have a vacancy. Um, all right, let's go to a vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion as written here with the amendment um, uh, with a roll call, Laurent? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all very much. Um, and as Meredith said, uh, the language will be, um, Meredith, do you want us to give you official power to um, amend the language or the, the way it's written as the intention, is that sufficient for you? That would be fantastic, just in case. You want a formal mm -hmm. motion? Yeah. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Um, motion to give um, the director of public health the powers to um, finalize the draft um, with the spirit of Was the spirit of was recommended by the board. Could I ask for clarification, please? Are are we voting to authorize you, Meredith, in the health department to finalize this or to draft, finalize the regulations, or to draft them and bring them back? for a vote. No, finalize them. Okay. As long as the intention is on par with what you guys. Okay. Just and it's not, I realize it shouldn't be recommended with, with the spirit that was approved. We authorize her, excuse okay. me. I jumped on your, yeah. your language there, Laura. No, that's fine. Check out the powers. Uh, was, it, was it spirit or intent? I don't like the word spirit. Can we put intent? Okay, and then the T to my last first name. Hmm? What was that? Yeah. First name, Laurent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Are you happy with that uh, motion, Laurent? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion about this motion? Um, just a question. So after that draft is completed, it goes into effect 
and Meredith will send it to us for signature? Or how, what, just what would that next step be? Yes, we'll do an electronic signature. Kelly will send it to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we need an effective date too. I don't think that was in the draft. Right. Well, that depends on when you are able to do that. ASAP. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, so if we give 24 hours and you do it tomorrow, that means uh, Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. Do we want to do Wednesday at noon? I'm not sure. Oh, we generally do it 12.01 a.m. Yeah. Do we need to put a date on it or can we leave that to Meredith? No, you need to put a date on it. That means you have to do it within that amount of time. I'll do this first thing tomorrow. I'll connect with attorney Seawald. So it'll be done tomorrow and we'll put out a press release tomorrow. So at least 24 hour notice. So Wednesday, 1201. Would Thursday be more reasonable if you put a press release or Thursday at 1201 or, or is that too much? That's fine. Um, should that be a separate motion? I'm just, I'm sorry, I, um, I'm, I'm just going to advocate for Wednesday, um, only because the press release can, we don't have to wait for the press release to be disseminated. So if this what, can be done tomorrow, what's wrong with Wednesday? My, my question is, can, can an order, is it 24 hours from the moment everybody has signed electronically? And can everybody sign by noon tomorrow? Well, I don't think that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, would it be helpful to have that date put here in the motion? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, like with back. an effective date, with with an effective com commencement on what is the the Wednesday, August the eleventh. 11, yeah. At 12.01 a.m. Lawrence, are you happy with your motion? Um, yes. Um, I can't remember who seconded it last time. Is there a second? I think I did. I'll second it again. And is there any more discussion about this motion? Um, the motion reads, uh, there's a motion by Lauren to authorize the director of public health to finalize the draft with the intent that was approved by the Board of Health with an effective commencement date of August 11th at 12.01 a.m. Um, I assume that it's um, understood that we're referring to the other motions up above. <clears throat> um, if there's no further discussion, we can put it to a vote. Uh, for a roll call, Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, nice work, board. Thank you. That was not so easy. Um, any other discussion on this subject before we move on to our minutes? All right. Uh, has anyone, everyone had a chance to look at our minutes from uh, June, I believe. Um, I, I, I did look at the minutes. Um, I made a, a, a few style comments and reminded that when we have abbreviation, this should be spelled out and that was it. <laughs> so I send them back to Kelly 
And I don't know if that was circulated to the rest of the, the board. Okay. Um, Kelly, did we send out the minutes that I amended? I, I saw that. I saw yes. this with your edits. Oh, you I did. did. I did not send out Lawrence. I was waiting to see if there were other comments from the other board members. Okay. Um, so you guys saw the minutes that I had already amended. And the only comment from Laurent was to spell something out instead of... Um... Well, there, there are a few edits. I think I can't go one by one because there was more than one. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's really primarily uh, style. And uh, so it, it's, it's minor, but it's more, it's, it would take a lot of time to go through them one by one. My, my suggestion uh, would be to simply uh, uh, not worry about it and just, just recirculate them for the next meeting. So you suggest we don't approve the minutes uh, now, but, but bring them back next time with your- uh, Unless you want to spend the next 30 minutes going through them one by one. I don't think it's a good, it's a good use of the board's time. <laughs> Um, okay, so we will put aside. Um, thank you, Vivian, and thank you, Ke uh, Kate. Um, we will put aside the minutes for now and bring them to the next meeting um, with uh, Lawrence amendments. Um, any um, anything else, Meredith? Do you have any other updates? I don't for you at this time, Dr. Levin. Okay. Um, and let's talk about our next meeting. Uh, we had a September meeting. When was it? Let's see. September 9th, I believe, worked for everybody. That's when I have on my calendar, the 9th. Are we changing from the third Thursday of the month? No, oh. it's just that uh, in September, the third Thursday is a Jewish holiday. Oh, gotcha. Um, is there a need? Um, this is a month away, but I, I know initially we had decided not to meet in August and then things changed. So is there a possibility that we'll need to talk again in, say, two weeks from now? I think so. I, I think this is going to be rapidly evolving. So I'd like to keep it on the books just in case. So we um, we didn't have a date. Did we have we didn't have any dates in August? But aside, we but did. The third Thursday is the nineteenth. Yeah, we had the nineteenth if we were going to meet. Yeah, and is that still a good date for everybody? Um, yeah, I had the, I had that we were not meeting that day, but that's okay. I can I, meet. I also day. had we didn't have that meeting, but nineteen is ten days from now. Do we want to wait the following week, like? The week of the 23rd or? I thought we were saying September 9th was our next meeting. I guess Lauren was asking if we needed to meet sooner than uh, that. Let's pick a yes. date that if we decide, if someone feels the need to meet sooner, that we'll have the date. Um, so is the 19th good for everyone or is it 26th? Either one is good for me. 19th is better for me, but um, 19th is better for me. I would have to leave the meeting on the 26th, but um, early. Whatever. Lauren, 19, okay with you? E e either one is e it's fine, but I, I'm just thinking is if, if we have, you know, do, do we want to split in the middle and say have it not on a Thursday necessarily? If it has to be, say, the 23rd or 24th. I I'm just floating this. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's, it works. E any date works for me. I'm just looking at a calendar, realizing. Where is the halfway point between now and the ninth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can certainly do the nineteenth. I have no no issue with that. Suzanne, does that work for you? Uh, either date works for me, and Monday the twenty third works for me too. All right, Kelly, can you keep uh, keep that information in your in your uh, write that down somewhere? Twenty third. Um, is not ideal for me, but I could make it work. Cynthia, does 23rd work for you? Yes, it does. Okay, so 23rd is a possibility, 19th is a possibility, and 26th, not ideal for me, but I could make it work. 
26 for everybody else? And I would have to leave early on the 26, depending on how long we go. Right. And, well, I, I, and, mm -hmm. and I don't want to lose that um, pesticide bill because it's mm -hmm. been floating around. So I don't know where we'd want to put that. So. Well, since we're not sure we're meeting again in August, I think we put that pesticide bill and um, on the September agenda um, and invite her back um, to teach us about that. Um, okay, so we have the 19th, the 23rd or 26th as possible dates, 19th being the best for me. Um, any other, anything else anybody wants to bring up? I'm sorry, Joanne, I just don't know what possible dates. Are we gonna pin this down or not? No, I think we're gonna we're gonna meet in September unless someone oh, okay. says that things are moving Meredith or whoever says things are moving fast, we think you know we need to do something else. Thank Meredith, you. does that sound right to you? Yeah. Okay. So as of now, the next scheduled meeting is September 9th unless we decide to meet sooner. All right. Um, anything else? I think we're good to go. Thank you everyone who attended and everyone who spoke and thank you uh, board members, Meredith, Kelly, everybody for participating. Move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Thank you and good night.